question about, say, remote locations or lost objects or, or world events. It's just like any other skill. Some people, say, with, with musical talent are good at reading music. Others are good at improvising and then getting into the different styles of music. And it's the same thing with your psychic abilities. Another comparison here is that anybody has the ability to at least bang out some notes on a piano. And then there's obviously prodigies from the time that they're born. And it's really the same thing with your psychic abilities. And I'm just blown away that both with myself that I could have lived to almost the age of 29 and there's people who die, it's millions of people who die without ever really realizing the extent of their abilities and I think that it's just so important that for one we get over this idea that there's only a few gifted people out there with these abilities, it's completely not true, there's most people have them. One of the um, amazing features of entanglement and probably one of the reasons it may, it's so hard for many people to comprehend or believe in is that it really goes all the way down or all the way back. So uh, it, in a strong sense, the Big Bang, if that's the way the universe started, was an entangled state and all of whatever developed after that still is entangled. This implies if, even if it's not um, true in, in, in complete detail, the model suggests that we are entangled with each other uh, even at huge distances. Um, coming down to earth, so to speak, I think it means without much question that there is some, a little bit of entanglement present in the relationships of everybody on the planet. So it shouldn't be very surprising when we discover that uh, a big event in the world like um, the tragedy of 9-11 causes very, very large numbers of people to think about the same kind of thing, increase their entanglement, and um, result in a measure on our random event system, which we haven't talked about uh, in detail yet, but <laughs> we probably should. Is there a God consciousness field it's remarkable if we consider the Bible book of Genesis in the first and second verses that God is actually creating the universe and the earth by moving God's Spirit over the face of water. If a small group of human brains can affect the structure of water, scientifically demonstrated, then perhaps we can understand how God the overall consciousness of the universe created the universe and the earth and the planets the same way, just on a grander scale. But if we are affecting water and everything around us all the time with our consciousness, what will happen when we become a mature and singular civilization? What kind of power will we possess then? We may be inadvertently affecting all kinds of events, from weather through growth through literally how people are behaving. If you have a half a billion people having a hatred for another group of people, that summated intention and energy, if you follow just where our research is going, uh, our lab and other labs, leads us to the conclusion that we are gonna be having these synergistic effects, that we're all interconnected through our consciousness and our energy. And so therefore, we need to we need to become conscious of this, and then we need to be able to, to transform our consciousness so we can take more responsibility for the effects that we're having on everything else in our environment. One time you said to me, there, there is no universe outside this mind. This mm -hmm. mind is the universe, and I, I really know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is very realistic thing, huh? very yeah. practical thing. Universe or mind is real life, our life. Mm -hmm. Quantum physicists are now seeing that yeah, yeah, yeah. the mind and the universe, yeah. the observer and the observed are the same. Yeah. They affect each other. Yeah. They're in a constant relationship. There's a distinction between saying, where can all this information be stored? versus 
where can all this information be processed? Okay. Yeah, right. In terms of the storage question, what what quantum physics tells us, and when particularly when you integrate that with systems theory, um, what you therefore realize is that you can store an infinite amount of information in an infinitely small space. Um, and you can think about this, if you imagine, for example, that we're out in space and we're much tinier than a, than a pinhead. And there's light coming from all directions, from all these distant galaxies, which contains information about billions and billions of stars, right? And all this information is crisscrossing through the universe. So everything's coming in all directions. It's all crisscrossing, all at the same time. And if you're in a tiny little spot, if you had spherical consciousness or spherical vision, you could be seeing the light coming from here and the light coming from here and the light coming from here and the light coming from here. And all of it's crisscrossing. And the amazing thing is, all of that's going on all of the time and none of it's getting distorted. In fact, photons literally can cross one another and they may summate or they may cancel we call it cancel out. They appear to summate or cancel, but after they've, quote, crossed each other, they go on as if nothing had happened. And if that wasn't the case, when we looked up at the sky at night, we would see mush, because all the photons would be interacting with all the other photons, right. and they would be just creating a complex, quote, mess. So instead, the universe appears to be designed to be able to have all this information from all these directions, constantly mixing in every part of space simultaneously and none of it gets mixed up. So if you think about that power, forgetting about how that happens, let's just say that it does happen. That's why you and I can look up at the sky at night and our little pupils are this big. We're seeing this gigantic vastness. All that star information is going into your pupil, it's going into my pupil, it's going on simultaneously. So all that holistic information is simultaneously present in every single spot. We take that idea, which is a fact, Forgetting about how it works, it works. And then what you do is you combine with, with the idea of a system. And a system is two or more things that are connected and they're sending feedback, circulating information and energy back and forth. And through the interaction, the parts come together and the whole becomes, quote, greater than the sum of its parts. Hydrogen and oxygen come together, the two gases, they send, have feedback, they circulate energy and information. And what happens, we get a liquid called water, which has all the unique properties of waterness. Now, what's common among every, sim every system, whether it's uh, an electron and a proton in an atom, or whether it's two molecules coming together, or whether it's two strands of DNA, or, or two cells be it in the heart of the, heart of the brain, or um, two people, or two planets, or two galaxies, it doesn't matter. If, if the components are sharing information and energy, and it's circulating, then what happens is that there is a storage process that takes place and this storage process is also an evolving one. The take home message, the way that this first came to me when I was a professor at Yale many years ago is what goes around and stays around evolves around. Information that doesn't all disappear, not only is it preserved, but it could potentially grow because it can be influenced by the other things around it. Once you recognize that idea, then you realize that not only does everything at every level have, quote, memory, I call this systemic memory, but this memory is in a state of constant evolution. In fact, a prerequisite for learning itself is feedback. And we know that's the case. I mean, we know in daily life, we want to learn to, for example, shoot a basket or learn to play a musical instrument. We have to get feedback about whether we're making the right notes or whether we're getting the baskets and the ball. The feedback is what provides us with a corrective process. It's called negative feedback or positive feedback. Now it turns out that feedback operates at every level, from the, mic the tiniest micro level to the most gigantic macro level and every level in between. So you take the infinite nature of the storage of information in the vacuum of space with photons, and now you add systems operating with feedback loops at every single level, and all of a sudden you realize what we call a neural network of our brain, which makes our brain's capability for processing all this information. Imagine now that each of our individual brains are part of a much bigger brain, which happens to be on the Earth, and the Earth is part of a planetary brain, which begin, becomes part of a solar system brain, that then becomes part of a galactic brain. And what I mean by brain here is a network of circulating feedback loops. 
then what you realize is at every level you get this process of assimilation of ever more complex information. And if that boggles the mind, well, too bad. <laughs> we just have to expand our minds to be able to see this. So it's interesting to see that we have both Democrat and Republican presidents involved in different aspects of this Department of Peace movement that would actually be a U.S. Department of Peace. So um, actually this current bill that's in Congress right now, H.R. 808, was first was written and first introduced by Congressman Dennis Kucinich from Ohio in July 11, 2001 which to me is very important uh, to remember the date because it was exactly two months before 9-11. And the, the legislation was written as a proactive, solution-oriented uh, new department, tiny new department that would be at the table, sitting at the table with the president and all the, um, the, the uh, departments of uh, the different department heads to actually be another tool for the president to decide if we have no other options, then, then perhaps we would have to go to war. But if we did have other options, a lot of those options would come from the Secretary of Peace. And so Congressman Kucinich introduced this bill in July of 2001. I heard about it in the newspaper. I wrote him a fan letter. And I said, Dear Congressman Kucinich, thank you for introducing this legislation, which is incredible legislation. Uh, uh, we were a country at peace, July 11, 2001. We were fairly uh, peaceful around the world. And I said, you know, you and I are both from Cleveland. We're both raised Catholic. We're both short and we're both vegetarian, although mm -hmm. he's vegan. So I said, we have a lot in common. We both love peace. Mm -hmm. So he wrote me back a very nice letter thanking me for my interest. And then it wasn't until um, Marianne Williamson, who is now a friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, had an email list in um, uh, March of 2003, so about a year and a half later, uh, Marianne invited anybody that would like to go to Washington to learn about this Department of Peace legislation, to learn how to go into our Senate and congressional offices on the Hill in Washington, and to have intelligent conversations with our elected representatives about creating a sister department, a new department, which would be this Department of Peace. And so um, I went to Washington. With, uh, there were six of us from Arizona, joined 200 people. Uh, so that was four years ago, so it was the United States working on creating a Department of Peace. And now here we are four years later in, in uh, May of uh, 2007 with 28 countries now around the world working to create Departments of Peace with 50,000 grassroots volunteers around the, the country and the world that are uh, networking with all kinds of groups, educating people about what the Department of Peace legislation is all about. Mm -hmm.